My name is Margaret Jacobs, and I am a member of the Aquazosti Mohawk Nation. I am a metalsmith who creates fabricated sculpture and jewelry. I find metal is an incredibly versatile material that lends strength and visual weight to the work, but can also be formed so that it is organic and delicate. My studio process is fairly intuitive. I primarily use metal in my work because these raw materials can be used to make a combination of organic textures and surfaces. I begin by drawing. I have certain patterns and shapes that I use continually in my work. Sometimes I'll use a pattern, but often I'll freehand the shape that I'm going for. After I've roughed out the shapes, then I will cut out multiple patterns from a sheet of steel with my plasma cutter. After I've cut out my patterns and cleaned them up with my angle grinder, I'll start to hot form them by using a propane forge. The forge heats up the metal and then I will use an anvil and hammer to give them the beginning forms and movements that I want. I fabricate my work using several techniques, hot and cold forming, forging, welding, and grinding. Overall, I'm using a variety of processes and I tend to jump back and forth quite a bit. I'll start by roughing out the forms and movement that I'm going for. I have specific ideas and concepts that I continually revisit and rework. In my steelwork, I utilize traditional blacksmithing tools and techniques, primarily hot forming with a propane forge, but I combine the elements and continue to work and shape with a torch throughout the process. I find that this technique gives me the ability to create objects that feel alive and full of movement. I use a combination of found objects along with new raw materials that I cut and form to match. I often integrate found metal objects into my work, trying to modify them so that what I've fabricated blends seamlessly into what I've found. I also try to respond to the material and work with it, not fight against it. My old growth series intertwines recognizable iron workers tools with culturally and familiarly relevant plants and objects found in nature. The spud wrenches are a visually direct reference to the history of Mohawk high steel workers that built skyscrapers in every U.S. city. In this series, I'm intermingling iron workers, spud wrenches, found chain, and antique barn hardware with my constructed medicine plants. My choice of using and modifying found chain and hardware gives these individual pieces a sense that they contain an old and established history, and I integrate the made with the found so that they are cohesive. Surface patina and color plays a large role in my work. I tend to keep my sculpture blackened so that overall it reads as a single form and alludes to drawing and interacts with created shadows. I create jewelry along with my sculpture. Jewelry gives me an alternative visual language to explore, and I find that I can create work that is accessible to the public in a way that's different from the sculpture. Again, I begin by patterning and drawing. I create jewelry and accessory pieces that are bold and sculptural objects. When I'm working on a specific piece, I'll look for images to reference, then I'll begin to draw and rough out the shape that I would like the final piece to have. 
From that, I'll make a specific pattern for the work. My jewelry tends to explore the natural world and man-made materials, while embracing and intermingling technology with materials more frequently associated with indigenous work, such as antler, shell, and horn. I have several patterns that I will use over and over again. I use both silver and powder coated brass in my work, pairing them with natural materials. These fish pieces have taken several different forms. You can see that I have an oxidized silver and pearl necklace and then a powder coated brass and leather lighter holder. With my jewelry, I'm more exact with my patterning. I'll glue onto brass and then hand saw my pieces. I integrate color through the powder coating process, which I personally execute in my own studio. This process gives me the ability to add incredibly unique colors, textures, and layering choices to my work. I believe that both my steel and jewelry works are exploring the same ideas, but through slightly different visual vocabularies. I tend to keep the aesthetic of my work visually graphic. My sculpture is generally complex in form with the surface blackened, while my jewelry is vibrant and colorful with less emphasis on complexity of form. With both media, I try to balance the complex with the minimal to create both tension and harmony in my work. Hi, I'm Nancy Sipi and I'm an exhibiting artist at Ava Gallery in Lebanon. And the title of my show is Something From Nothing and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my process and my work. Thank you for visiting. I'm going to start by talking about one of three panels that are in this show. They're sort of a trio, although they're exhibited separately. And the title of this piece is Home. And what it is is a, a pattern that I designed and had printed on wallpaper and installed onto a panel. And on the panel, I installed a shelf and a glass bottle. In the background on the wallpaper are different images. There's um, a rabbit, a cloud, a house, and some other images. And they tie in, as we'll see in the next two pieces, there's a, they all sort of tie in with one another. This is the second wallpaper panel, and this one's called Magic. And what's happening here is the panel, and there's a glass cone with a mirror. And on the panel, there's a pattern with all kinds of, there are different characters. There are a few different characters and different things going on. So I encourage you to come and look closely and see if you can come up with some kind of narrative to describe what's actually happening in this piece. And the third piece of the trio is called Heaven. And this is a pattern um, of clouds and there's a, a face. And to give you a better sense of what's happening here, there's a, a cast iron um, disc. And from the disc is a piece of wire and this is a wooden 
This is a wooden ball hanging from the end. So that's the trio. It's home, magic, and heaven. And they all have, um, they're all tied in together. So if you come look at them, you'll be able to see how they are a group. In this exhibit, I also have some video work. I make animations and composite them with video and I add sound. And this piece is called Oracle. And it is a magnifying lens. So you're looking through the magnifying lens to this video inside. And what the video is of is a woman on a unicycle going back and forth on a rope, like a tightrope. Oops. And um, each time she goes by, she, she sort of transforms from, uh, she's got these different sort of personas that that happen. And one, she's a Perseus with the head of Medusa. She's a wolf in another. And one, she looks, you know, she's got her normal, normal face. And um, there's sound, so there's headphones. So you put the headphones on and you can listen. This is another video piece. It's called Rock, Paper, Scissors. And it has a plaque, a wooden plaque. And it's sort of figurative. It's like a figure holding a wooden plaque that has some words on it. And whoops, I'm just going to raise it up here. From the sort of head of the figure is a scene of a um, desert kind of landscape with a structure that is seemingly empty except maybe for a staticky television and a door that will close all the way and there's wind and emptiness. And this is another video piece. This is animation and video and it has sound so you can listen to the, the sound while you watch. And what this is, is a cabinet. So it's a, it's a little cabinet. And inside is a video. And this piece is called Something from the Sea. And you'll see something emerge from the sea. It's basically um, these figures come out of the sea and each one casts a letter and eventually there are three words that get spelled out and then the words disappear and it all starts over again and related to the piece we just looked at conceptually the word this piece also has three words and this is a piece of wood and wire and wooden balls and the some of the balls have letters on them and they each spell out a word so I encourage you're allowed to touch this so if you come into the gallery you can move it around and figure out what it spells and this one's called fortune teller and I have another piece that you're allowed to pick up and play with and this is called love game and it has inside it says love and there's a metal ball and you roll the ball around until you get it into the O like that I just got it I don't know if you can see it you can't see it I'm going to tip it it just dropped so I encourage you to pick this up and see if you can make it work. And that's it. There are other pieces here. So I encourage you to just come and check the show out. And um, the other artists have some beautiful work. And thanks for visiting. We live in a world of objects. And to me, they are so interesting and endlessly diverse. As a culture, we're very fond of objects. We're fond of collecting them, of ownership and possession. Um, and of course, that lends itself to 
still life and still life photography, there's plenty of subject matter. Still life, uh, of course, has its origins in a, as a form of painting, and it was often used to portray the plenty and the wealth of the painter's clients, their possessions, you know, not only bowls of fruit, but, you know, foods and gorgeous tables full of uh, sumptuous wares. So what do objects represent to us? What is their significance now? Um, of course, how we view objects is very much influenced by how they are pre presented. Um, what is the context in which we see an object? So, speaking of objects and their presentation, here is a very everyday object. We all recognize this. And is it saying anything? How do we think about it in its, in its uh, current uh, form of presentation? How about now? What does it say? Anything? Is it interesting? Does it evoke any, any um, feelings about the nature of eggs? Maybe not in isolation so much, but... Now, how about this? Does this say anything about eggs? Does it talk about fragility or the temporal nature of objects? So you can play like that. It's, it's, it's fun to play. It's always fun to play. So, how about in the context more of a traditional still life? Still life with eggs, an egg and pears. And by the way, in case you haven't guessed already, I am working in my kitchen. I do not have a studio, and there's really no fancy equipment here. There's a very ordinary table lamp. Lighting, although, is very important. See how it changes. Changes the way the subjects look. We have no lighting at all, that's just daylight can have real hard shadows, etc. And that all adds, I think, to how the subject matter might be taken by the viewer. Go to another scenario, a little more weird. What does this say about eggs? Or that egg? Is it interesting? What happens if we fiddle with the lighting? Or if we get close in. Books are a special kind of object. There's more to them than just the paper and string and cardboard that they're made of. They contain entire worlds between their covers that we can enter and exit at will. And they're full of many, many important things, and in fact, they do constitute receptacles for our culture in many ways. And look at all these wonderful illustrations. These are the first cells that were ever seen down a microscope. Louis Pasteur. How, uh, how topical is that? <laughs> Vaccines. Look at all these beautiful illustrations. And I use these in my, in my photographic works. It's, it's hard to convey books merely from photographing their text. So let's take a quick look here at some of the actual works in this show. This first one here, I hope you can see that, is unlike most of the work, is actually the aftermath of a real incident. 
So there really was a chicken, ours, who repeatedly was flying over the electric fence. Not very smart when there are foxes and coyotes and fisher cats all around. So I had to refer to a book <laughs> to understand how to cut her flight feathers without hurting her and yet do it effectively. So this is the actual aftermath. Her feathers are on the ground and the scissors and the book are all there. That was uh, a fortuitous thing and uh, a little story there. Let's go on. Sorry, this is the living room. This is, um, uh, you can see that very well because I have to use the, um, the, the landscape uh, frame for this video. Um, this is quite different. This is all pretty much fantasy. Um, it, it does have skulls in it. Skulls are very, very interesting photographically. And there are books about skulls, believe it or not. So on top of being about skulls, isn't it also about writing and handwriting? Is uh, cursive handwriting becoming extinct? Dead like the skull? Seems that it's not taught anymore. Anyway, I'm not going to belabor too much symbolism into this. You can do it yourself. Um, I like the way that the um, the geometry in the fabric also is uh, echoed in the geometry of that paper skull. On we go. Here we are. Now these, these fungi, someone asked me if they were really real. Yes, they are really real, or they were when they were photographed. And I found them all in the woods behind our house. It was an exceptionally rainy fall after a dry summer and it just spurred the fruiting all at once. But um, more than that, fungi are so mysterious when you find them. They're just these, these strange things like growing out of the forest floor. You know, what are they? We can talk about them in books, but it doesn't really explain away the, the totality of the mystery to me. They are just beautiful objects. Um, mysterious, that's why I called it Twilight's Fruit, to sort, of, to sort of capture or try to capture that slightly otherworldly um, air that they have about them to me. Speaking of things that come from the woods, and I bet I get a lot of questions about this, so I'll answer them, I'll try. This, for all you meat eaters, which includes me, I eat meat. This is a legally procured, legally harvested Vermont small game animal. Um, it is wholesome, it is organic, it never saw a chemical or a hormone or an antibiotic in its life. And it is nutritious and wholesome. So why aren't we hungry when we look at this? Maybe some of you are. But, you know, we eat meat, don't we? On to the next. Something completely different. Ah, uh, yes, Magritte. Sorry about the couch in the back, but I don't know what to do about it under my circumstances. Um, yeah, I really like the Surrealists. I don't try to copy Surrealism in my work, but I love the way that they suspend all the previous concepts about how th how things should look or how they're depicted, but they're still 
in a way realistic. I love that duality of them. They they challenge you. They they're just delightful and um, arresting. All of that. So that's my homage to Magritte, who is one of the surrealists, probably one of the better known. And going past the couch, this work is a little bit dark here. Sorry about that. Is shows a beautiful sailing ship and a picture of a ship in a tempest in a book. But the nearest water is actually in the bathtub on which they are perched. So what does it mean? It's, it, it's, um, it's a fantasy voyage. It can't be real, but you can pretend and you can yearn, you can yearn for voyages of discovery and, and uh, tempests at sea from the safety of your home. <laughs> so that is really, I think, the end of my video. You'll just have to ask me questions. I'm sure you can email me. And thank you for your interest in my work.